snap this dinosaur-like head rising up from the water in vivid colour with visible features and, like, a cheeky grin. <laughs> <laughs> it always makes me smile. And a tartan hat. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Talking Till Dawn. I'm Martin and with me is the eerie Michael Whitehouse. How are you doing, Mike? Good evening, everyone. I'm fine, mate. How's life? Yeah, not too bad. I would say mm, about 7 out of 10. <laughs> it's better than Colin Cthulhu. <laughs> yeah. Give that a 5. <laughs> five, 5 is a perfectly neutral score. That's not a negative aspersion on Call of Cthulhu. Okay. This is the second episode of well it's the third episode of talking till dawn it's the second episode of a kind of mini series dealing with nessie and the loch monsters of scotland in the last episode of this we talked a little bit about the history and the origins of the legend if you've not caught that please do go and check it out in this episode we're going to be talking about some of the evidence some of the hoaxes some of the expeditions and the sort of cultural trajectory of the Nessie slash Loch Monster concept through the 20th century. Thanks, by the way, to everyone who's tuned in so far. We really appreciate the support. We've had some great comments, I think, as well, across the various platforms, haven't we, Mike? Yeah, uh, the podcast goes out on YouTube, but it also goes out now across your podcast app of choice, which we'll mm-hmm. talk about later. But yeah, we got a bunch of comments uh, one of my favourites was on the, the first episode, which was part one of the Loch Ness Monster, and it was from Doodle Art Lover, and they started off with, I am not interested in the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> However, I love your channel, and I will give this subject a listen Maybe open Maybe mind. we can change their mind. Maybe we can change their mind. Yeah. Thanks to Doodle Art Lover for that. It really made me laugh, actually. just uh, But they did say in the end, they said uh, uh, they will listen with an open mind and wait for the next subject. Thanks, guys. Love you. Love you too, the art lover. We're not necessarily approaching this from an entirely solid believer aspect. We're kind of giving it a little bit of both sides of the argument, you know. Well, that that reminds me of, uh, there was a comment on uh, episode two, the last episode, which was uh, when we explored the strange possession of Maria Tallarico. Mm -hmm. Very interesting case. Yeah, uh, it was. And if I can even find it. Do you know what? Maybe it was in the first episode and I've just... Do you know what it was in the first episode? I do apologise. It was from Dina Morgan. They said, Thanks for sharing Loch Legends other than Nessie. I'm interested in some cryptids. I have fond memories of the Discovery Channel special when they used sonar to probe the depths Mm -hmm. of Loch Ness, Mm -hmm. but have not heard nearly enough stories about the other lochs and their possible inhabitants. That's Dina, that's why I enjoyed the last episode because Martin has done all of the research on this topic and there's stuff like that I had I had no idea about. Um even even though I have a love of Scottish folklore there's so much in Scotland, you know, yeah. I don't really I haven't really focused on the locks. Yeah, no definitely. Um keep keep your comments coming in if you've got any suggestions for stuff you'd like us to talk about or you've got comments on something that we've discussed in the past, please do, you know, penny for your thoughts and all that. So in the last episode of Loch Monsters, we talked a little bit already about some of the early evidence. We talked about the Hugh Gray photograph, which is the the very ambiguous image, the first ever supposed photograph of the Loch Ness Monster. We talked about the famous George Spicer sighting. In this episode, yes, we're going to cover the big one, the one everyone knows. You've seen it, even if you don't know you've seen it, the famous Nessie photo. And I think that's probably a good starting point as any. On April the 21st, 1934, not long after the Hugh Gray photograph came out, not long after George Spicer's sighting, just as Nessie Mania was really kicking into high gear, the London Daily Mail published a startling image. This is an image known as the surgeon's photograph after Dr. Robert Kenneth Wilson, who was a gynecologist who claimed to have taken the photo 
And the picture really would become the iconic image of the Loch Ness Monster. It's the image everyone knows, as I say, it clearly and unambiguously shows what appears to be an elongated head and neck rising above the waves. After this was published, all the kind of talk of water horses and strange fish dried up almost overnight and were replaced by... I like by... that pun, dried up. I like that. Do you know, actually, I don't know if that was an intentional pun or not. I can't remember. Um, <laughs> <laughs> am I giving away you that just this said is... it! <laughs> you mean you've written it uh, down? I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, instantly, that was all replaced by open speculation about relict plesiosaurs surviving in the loch. For 60 years, this surgeon's picture... And if you haven't seen it, you surely you must have, but we'll include all these images yeah, in the yeah, notes. everyone's seen this. If you haven't seen it, you've seen artists' representations of it. It's on books, it's on comics, it's on, on souvenirs. For 60 years, this was considered probably the best photographic evidence of a creature in the loch. It graced, as I say, you know, the front of dozens of books, memorabilia, souvenirs, and through all this, it set people's expectations. It formed the benchmark by which other sightings would then be judged. But we'll return to this image in a little moment before we get too deeply into the story of this because... Twists and turns already. I like I it. don't know if I'm, I'm giving too much away right now by saying all was not what it seemed with that image. I don't think that's a spoiler anymore, but we'll just leave it at that. All is not what it seems with that image. I wanted to quickly take a look at a small selection of the other photographic evidence that's been captured over the years. And again, all of these images, or at least the images that we have, will be included in a document that we release in the notes or the in the comments. So the first one would be the Taylor film. So in 1938, one G. E. Taylor of Natal, South Africa, saw an object moving in the loch not far from Foyers. Foyers, if you remember, is where... Hugh Gray took his famous photograph as well. This was about uh, four or five years later. He described what he saw as large and rounded, straw-coloured and having a tapered neck with the visible part being about six feet in length. What he saw remained at the surface for an extended period of time. It wasn't just a glimpse. It was long enough for Taylor to actually leave and return 45 minutes later with another witness. He actually was able to go and get someone else and bring them back. And during this time, he was able to capture two sequences of 16 millimeter color film. And this was claimed to be the first motion picture footage of the Loch Ness Monster. There was also a, a sort of newsreel piece that was published in uh, 1936, but that was probably faked. It was a little kind of fluff piece. Unfortunately though, and there's a like kind of mini mystery here with the Taylor film. I like it. The whereabouts of that footage are now unknown. Really? <laughs> yeah, the, the original materials were lost, no known copies were made, but there were a few stills captured by researchers in the mid-20th century, and also... How did they get them? Well, when the film was still in existence. Oh, right, right, okay. So the film did the rounds pre-YouTube era, obviously, so no not everything thing, was man. instantly made available to the public. No such thing. What happened was this guy sent his film around various experts, biologists, etc. And there was only like, you know, the original film doing the rounds of the various Loch Ness experts. And they would have examined it. So people would have seen it, but it wouldn't it didn't go public. However, one of the people who saw it um made a a series of drawings of each frame. So you can actually online there's one Loch Ness researcher who's actually put these drawings together to create like a mini animation of how the thing actually moved. It's a really interesting kind of almost reverse engineering, bringing the film back to life after it's been lost. So, so let me get this straight. This is a drawing, yeah, of frames of a film that is lost of a mythical creature, yes, that's disappeared. Yeah, I'm going to say this is all extremely accurate. Yeah, it's very, very questionable. But what is interesting is it doesn't move like a you know a log or it moves very much like a like a, a living object, at least from the little animation that I've seen where someone has animated together all of the, the different I need to check that out. It sounds fascinating. I really want to give the guy's name. I really feel I should credit this guy. He runs the Loch Ness Mystery blog and I've his name escapes me at this moment in time. Um, Robert Rowe. <laughs> yeah. 
but yeah, he runs this fantastic resource about the Loch Ness Monster. He's an ardent believer. I don't necessarily agree with everything that he believes in, but uh, yeah, he, he's done some amazing work, and, and this is fantastic. He's taken these drawings in the book and animated them together to bring this lost film back to life. It's really cool. We'll put his name in the show notes. We will, we will. The next piece of evidence would be the Dinsdale film, and this was captured on the 23rd of April, 1960. Tim Dinsdale was an aeronautical engineer and erstwhile monster hunter. He was a common sight around Loch Ness, this guy, for a quarter of a century. But it was the eerie footage that he captured on the final day of his first ever trip to the loch before he became a full-time monster hunter, for which he's probably best remembered. The film, which does still exist, you can see it on YouTube, shows a dark hump travelling through the water, submerging and resurfacing. It may look like a distant blob to us in the film, but what Dinsdale saw through his binoculars was apparently enough to make him decide to dedicate his life to finding the monster. This guy would mount a further 55 expeditions to the loch between... Is nine... this... Sorry, is this the guy with the beard? The, One of the, several was... beardy From... type guys. <laughs> there was... Like, there was... There was a gentleman, and I forget his name, but he would any time there was anything about. No, I, I think you're talking about a later guy. This guy died in 1987. Ah, right. He, this guy Dinsdale, would spend 30 years watching the loch, mounting expeditions. He was involved with various other groups, scientific investigations. He really did dedicate a large chunk of his life, but he would never again capture the monster on film. Now, to me, the film itself is not that impressive. He looked at the same object as the film was shot through binoculars and he said what he saw was mind-blowing, right? The fact he never came back again with another piece of footage, another film, almost does confirm his honesty, I think, because yeah. if he had been full of shit, he'd spent 30 years doing this, he would have done it again, he would have gone, I'm not getting anywhere with this. I'm going to make a hoax just to justify what I'm doing here. It tells me that he certainly at least believed in what yeah, he saw. If you tend to look at people that are researching things like Bigfoot, not all obviously, but you get some who have made more than one yeah. startling discovery and uh, yeah, sometimes it does feel like people are kind of... Yeah chasing these things they're, they're trying to prove it maybe they maybe or that they do UFO, believe in it, but... that ufo abductee guy who every other week is posting another video of like a, an alien head that looks like a puppet appearing at his window oh the one that yeah that's right dinsdale's film as i say it's not super impressive some people have dismissed the object as a small boat but there is a control film taken by Dinsdale a short time later, like the same day, I think, in the same location, where he did actually get someone to pilot a small boat on the same course that the object took, and they don't look anything like each other. And if you find this film on YouTube, they've actually edited the two films together so that you can compare them. The, the boat is much more obvious as a boat, and it's not a big boat, so right. it would have had right. to have been something really quite small and low to the water that, that produced it. Some people have said it could be like a hay bale, that was blown into the water? I don't know. But apparently, analysis of the original 16mm negative by the Joint Air Reconnaissance Intelligence Centre concluded that it was most likely a large animate object. Oh. Mm. The Peter McNabb photograph. So, this was an image captured in 1955, and it's another one of the classic canon of Nessie pictures. On a warm summer afternoon, Peter McNabb was returning from holiday with his son when he stopped to get a photograph near Drumna Drocket. He noticed something gliding through the water uh, not far from Urquhart Castle. He quickly swapped lenses to capture a telephoto image with a castle tower in frame for scale next to the object. Much like the surgeon's photo, this is one of those instantly recognisable shots. We're looking down on the loch from a slightly elevated vantage point. And the tower of Urquhart Castle stands on a headland to the right-hand side of frame and it's reflecting down into the water. It's quite a peaceful, picturesque scene, but to the left, there's this pair of vast, dark humps in the water and they're, like, trailing awake behind them. Now, together, 
these shapes are at least as long as the castle is tall. So that means if the humps are both part of a single object, that puts its length at about 50 to 60 feet minimum. Really? It's quite, wow. you know, whatever that is, it's an object of considerable size. It would be, it would be massive. Yeah, some people think it might be a, a wave, like the shadow just catching a wave, right? I'm not too sure. Could be, but it is a, it's another impressive, memorable, culturally significant photograph of the quote-unquote Loch Ness Monster. Anytime I hear about the Loch Ness Monster and someone citing it, that's something that people always talk about is that mm -hmm. if if you're unfamiliar especially with being around lochs or lakes or mm -hmm. that you can get strange wave movement yeah on the top of the water especially if there's like a floating log or definitely and this is absolutely something we're going to come back to in the next episode because in the next episode we're going to do a lot of talking about what Nessie is and I don't think Nessie is one thing. Some of those things it's might be not so strange, and some of those things might be strange. Yeah, but that's something I think we'll come back to in the next episode. The next famous image that we'll talk a little bit about is the Tony Shields photograph, which was supposedly captured on the 21st of May 1977. Now, on the face of it, this is one of the clearest and most impressive images of the purported monster, or any supposed monster ever, basically. But it's also kind of a lesson for the credulous. Shields claimed to be... He claimed to have been camping by Urquhart Castle, so uh, near where the last photograph was taken, when he snapped this kind of dinosaur-like head rising up from the water, an almost perfect encore, actually, of the surgeon's photograph, but this time in vivid colour with visible features and, like, a cheeky grin as well, which <laughs> <laughs> it always makes me smile. And a tartan hat. Yeah, almost, <laughs> almost. It's actually known <laughs> as the, the Loch Ness Muppet, this image, because it looks <laughs> like, a, like a puppet. Obviously, as photogenic as the subject is, there's definitely something indefinable that triggers most people's bullshit detectors, and it triggers mine pretty hard. Yeah, There might be good reason for that, because depending on who you ask, this guy, Tony Doc Shields, is either a notorious hoaxer or an eccentric genius. Shields was and is, he's still alive, he's an old guy now, he's an artist, a playwright, a wizard, musician, <laughs> stage magician... This is like a character whose life is like worthy of a that's podcast amazing. on its own. A wizard. Oh, I've yeah. never. Oh, that's so good. He's a, no, he's actually like, on one hand, he's actually claims to have like magical powers. On the other hand, he is like right. a stage okay, magician. Yeah. A year prior to taking this photograph, though, he was running like a P.T. Barnum-esque show called Tom Fool's Theatre of Tom Foolery, which <laughs> mm, <laughs> raises some questions. But do you know what's funny? I was just going to say, do you know what's funny, though, is the fact that, like, like I've thought about that before, you know, I, I have a, I mean, you do as well, Martin, you know, we, we both have a real interest in, I suppose, what you would call kind of a anomalous phenomena, you know, things that, 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 that spark your imagination and, and about yeah. how the world really works, but... But we're also yeah, bullshit yeah, artists but, at but the this same is, time, so no one would yeah, believe us. Th this is what I was going to say, is that, you know, we also make short horror films and we write yeah. fiction and we do these sorts of things so like see if we ever did put some time to go and yeah. to investigate something and then we captured it on video like oh no one would ever no, take it seriously no. especially if we do something with tom fullery in the title <laughs> <laughs> well yeah that's that's true it's all a little bit like how I'm always slightly worried if anyone gets killed near me because I've got all these like true crime books yeah. and if the police came around to interview me, they'd be like, he does a like a horror YouTube channel, he does a podcast on weird things and he's Nick got him. all these true crime <laughs> books about serial killers and cults and stuff. Yeah, it's probably him. Yeah. But this guy, not only did he run a show called Tom Fool's Theatre of Tom Foolery, he also uh, travelled up and down the country on a press baiting monster raising tour I, I say monster raising in quotes and this involved using a coven of nude witches <laughs> as you do who happened to also be his daughters oh you're uh, joking you, no no this was the 1970s obviously it's still just a dark dark time parading yeah 
parading your naked daughters around, I think, and most yeah. times is well, it was, upon. it was, it was like uh, you know, new agey kind of shit. I know, but Michael, it was 1973. Yeah, it's fine. But what he was doing with his nude witches was he was trying to invoke these various mythological creatures, including the Ill Man of Monan and Mogor, the Cornish Sea Serpent. Now, there's actually a great piece of footage out there from a TV program called 14 TV. Do you remember 14 TV, Mike? Oh, 100%. Uh, the vicar with the leather jacket. Reverend Lionel Fanthorpe, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's him. That's well, him. he was interviewed, this guy was interviewed in 14 TV, <laughs> and he tried to summon Mogar with this big, ridiculous uh, chant that he did, and then it didn't appear, and then... Would you think for our benefit, Doc, you could make one last supreme effort to invoke Morgor? All right, then. Don't let it frighten you, though. I'll try not to. Morgor, I've got to send uh, Ten Dennis up here. It's probably there now. We're on the wrong side of the headland, are we? Yes, damn it. <laughs> then winks at the camera. <laughs> and it's just, he's ridiculous. He's a great guy. He's such a showman, but don't believe a word the guy says. He later suggested that the monster <laughs> in this photograph, uh, the Tony Shields photograph, yeah. was not the head and neck of like a plesiosaur yeah. type creature, but was the proboscis of an interdimensional squid beast that can phase between parallel universes. And that's why <laughs> you can see surface ripples of the water through its neck. And when people point this out, it's like, yeah, it's like a, <laughs> that's because it's like a half visible entity. That's amazing. I mean, you know, top marks, cool story. Phasing. This is good an excuse as any. Although he never publicly owned up to the hoax, he has since claimed that his life's work has been a kind of uh, surrealist performance art, and that's probably as close to a confession as we'll ever get. But yeah, I, I mean, Doc's Muppet is <laughs> far from the only hoax, you know, that, that <laughs> has been involved in you know the kind of Loch Ness legend some uh, die hard Nessie enthusiasts have been known to kind of downplay the impact hoaxers have had in the evolution of the, the myth quite often when questions get asked about the sincerity of a witness there's some people who are very quick to go oh you know this is a personal attack you have to you have to believe what honest people say but the fact remains there does exist a large body of exposed deception surrounding the monster. For example, in 2012, a new photograph emerged. This one was taken by a guy called Captain George Edwards. This is a skipper with 26 years experience in the loch. So he's like the perfect candidate for people to go, this guy knows what he's talking about. This is a, you know, a serious guy. He knows, he knows what he sees. He's got 26 years experience of the loch. Why would he hoax us? Why would he lie? Why would he be mistaken, right? The image itself is its a typically fuzzy image, but it does show a very solid, distinct hump rising out the water in deep water, far away from any rocks. There's ripples emanating from around it, so it's clearly a, you know, a physical object that's there that's interacting with the environment. Edwards claimed to have had this photo analysed by the US military, who had confirmed that it was indeed a living animal, shades of the, uh, the Dinsdale film there. This was hailed at the time, in 2012 as one of the best recent pictures of the creature and it was also it was like the Huffington Post the, the Daily Telegraph, ABC News this was like all over the major outlets at the time but it was local reporters from the Inverness Courier who finally persuaded Edwards to come clean in 2011 this guy was involved so the year before he was involved in the production of a documentary for National Geographic now I don't know if this is the documentary that the person who wrote into us was talking about, but he was involved in the production oh, of this yeah, documentary yeah. for the National Geographic channel called The Truth Behind the Loch Ness Monster. Now, this uh, this documentary featured dramatizations of the creature cavorting in the loch. To shoot these scenes, a fiberglass hump was commissioned by the producers, and Edwards finally admitted when he was probed by the members of the press from the, the Inverness Courier that it was this prop that he had photographed from the deck of his boat, the Nessie Hunter 4, that's the, the name of his boat, so you know he's legit, right? <laughs> there was no military experts ever consulted. That was just like another part of his ruse, but that was a claim that, you know, most media outlets just reprinted without 
any verification. Now, Edwards, he fake news, fake, fake news, fake exactly, news. fake news. He's like he considers himself a believer in the beast. He he wasn't doing this to mock people, at least as far as he claims. He runs a, a cruise company offering sonar tours of the loch, and he's completely unapologetic for this. Now, you could a, a cynic would say that he did it purely for self-interest, that he did it because he wanted ching, more people ching. to come. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He kind of sort of admits to this. He says his actions were a service to the local economy. But he also says that he was, this is an interesting one, following in the footsteps of a grand tradition of fellow hoaxers who used hoaxes to promote the loch and its tourist industry over the years. Oh. Fellow hoaxers, such as Robert Kenneth Wilson, because that picture, the surgeon's photo yep. that launched a hundred monster hunting expeditions, the most widely known depiction of the beast, is itself another hoax, as I'm sure you already knew, Mike. That's disappointing though, isn't it? It's disappointing. It is disappointing. I remember when it came out that that was a hoax. I was, I think I was still a kid at the time. It just been, not devastated, but what is, what even is real? Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> like, it's in a book. It must be true. It was. I have been lied to. So that that whole subterfuge, subterfuge, subterfuge. Turn into William Shatner here. Subterfuge came to light in 1994 when a dying man confessed to his own role in the conspiracy. The tale of that begins not actually with Wilson, but with an actor, film producer, and renowned big game hunter resplendently named Marmaduke Wetherill. Oh, now, Mike, if you weren't called Michael Whitehouse, wouldn't you like to be called Marmaduke Wetherill? Absolutely. Or Jack Burton. One of the other. Yeah, Jack Burton's a little bit better, but Marmaduke Wetherill's... I just, you know, I just imagine someone dressed like Crocodile Dundee. You're not far off, actually. You're really genuinely not <laughs> that far off. Yes! In December 1933, at the height of Nessie Mania, the Daily Mail dispatched Wetherill because he's this famous big game hunter, on an expedition to find the monster. He arrived in Scotland to like this big fanfare and almost immediately he happened upon a series of footprints in the mud at the Loch's Bank. Now Wetherill estimated that these tracks belonged to a large animal at least 20 feet in length, immediately crawling to mind the... crawling to mind? Calling to mind the abomination that was witnessed by the Spicers five months earlier, although crawling to mind actually actually works yeah, pretty well. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. So plaster casts were taken of these, and that was sent to the Natural History Museum. And zoologists there were in the process of analysing them. It was away at the Natural History Museum for a few months. But mean in the meantime, the Daily Mail, on the December 21st edition that year, triumphantly declared, Monster of Loch Ness is not legend but a fact. <laughs> oh, well, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, Mike, this proved to be a wee bit premature. Just a tad. Just a tad. So the museum announced its findings at the beginning of January. This was not the footprint of an unknown animal, they said. It was the impression of, you'll never guess what it was, Mike. Oh, wait, oh, wait I won't even try. I won't even try. Okay. It was the impression of a stuffed hippopotamus foot. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course it was. This was something that was sort of fashionably used as umbrella stands and ashtrays in the kind of uh, no way. dead to... animal yeah. festooned rooms. You used to see that in films. Yeah, exactly. films and you'd see, see it in cartoons. Yeah, definitely. It's, yeah, 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 100%. So this big game hunter had been duped by it piece of taxidermy awkward so he wasn't involved <laughs> well not as far as we know but the daily mail was humiliated because they'd published this big uh, headline declaring that they had proved that the loch ness monster was a real thing and blah 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 they very very quickly dropped weather like he was hot marmaduke unhappy about being snubbed by his financial backers set out to get revenge on the paper by making a hoax of his own Oh, no way. And this is where the famous head and neck photo comes in. To build the creature, he enlisted his own stepson, a guy called Christopher Spurling, who happened to be a keen model maker. It was Spurling who, 60 years later and nearing death, finally explained the hoax to two researchers, uh, Alistair Boyd and David Martin. 
The monster's neck and head were sculpted from a piece of synthetic wood and attached to a toy submarine that the conspirators right. had picked up for sixpence in Inverness Woolworths. I miss Woolworths. Yeah, you know? I, I, I miss I miss a lot of a lot of places in town. Borders, I really miss. They might talk about it. it hurts me too much. Yeah. <laughs> but Wetherill and his son Ian then returned to the loch, and they grabbed you know several photos of this twelve-inch monstrosity. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> bobbing around in in shallow water. I don't know why they shot it in the loch because it could have literally been any bit of water. A bathtub. Yeah. But they were actually almost busted. A water bailiff approached them at the water's edge and Wetherill very quickly stamped on the fake Nessie uh, to get it out of sight. It's probably still in the loch somewhere. Wow. But Wetherill's relationship, obviously, with the Daily Mail was was already soured. So he recruited a, a respectable friend of a friend, this Dr. Robert Wilson, the surgeon, to serve as, like, the middleman in the sale of the photo to hide Wetherill's involvement. Right. Wilson approached the male, claiming to have taken the picture himself while on a bird watching trip to Scotland. But he asked, in the first instance, he asked uh, not to be named in print, which, you know, seems pretty understandable in retrospect when you know what's behind it all. Yeah. The male, though, published this image on the front page on April 21st and sparked an international sensation. It went insane, it went crazy. This image was on newspapers and newsreels all over the world. It's not entirely clear why Wetherill and co. never came forward to reveal the hoax, though. That's I, what I was going to ask, because that seemed really strange to me. If that if, yeah. if that was intended to make fun of that mm-hmm. newspaper because, because of some injury. Because that seems to be the coup de grace, doesn't it? That seems yeah. to be the public humiliation of Do you know when Wetherill died? Daily Mail. Uh, that's a good question. I don't, he didn't die I mean, He didn't die before he yeah. could you know, release this. It, it was long enough later that that wouldn't be the reason. I thought maybe they were just unprepared for how much excitement the photograph would stir up. Yeah. People got so excited about it, maybe they were worried about the backlash. They may have been worried about going to jail. I mean, maybe I thought that that was a possibility. Mm-hmm. How do we know for a fact, though, that this guy who's claiming to be a, mo- a model maker that was involved, how do we actually know that that's true? Oh, that's a good question, actually. That's a one problem with it, isn't it? Although, I'm not going to lie, the picture has always kind of looked fake. Yeah, looks, once you it, know that, once, you, once all, you're aware I, I of used, that, yeah. When I was wee, I was always obsessed with doing, like, shadow puppets and things like that on the mm-hmm. wall mm-hmm. at night. Yeah. My dad used to show me how to do them, like different animals and things like that. You're a weird kid, Mike. Sorry, I know. These are the things I entertained myself with. and <laughs> Before you had television. Yeah. <laughs> and I always remember doing like a Nessie mm-hmm. with my hand. And it looks just like that photograph. <laughs> and you're just kind of like, it does look just like, like someone's kind of clenched hand. You should have photographed it and sent it into the Daily Mail. Did it, did it lap that up? <laughs> yeah, made some money. But I wondered yeah. also maybe... I mean, the Daily Mail is its not exactly known for journalistic excellence, is it? It kind of occurred to me maybe that maybe they paid him off. Maybe like he said, listen, I've got all this yeah. evidence. I've got photographic evidence that this is a fake. You've been had and they've said, all right, rather than us being humiliated again, here's a few grand to shut up. Or was he making any more money from it? After well, that. he wasn't I publicly mean, or, or was he wasn't that, publicly associated with it until but someone must been they must have been given money to the surgeon mm. for that picture you would think yeah the surgeon probably would have got cut into yes yeah so maybe yeah. he got a little bit of money from it that way it's yeah. a lot of hippo hunting you know like that's that money it's a lot <laughs> that's of hippo true. hunting how many animals have died for that image oh god <laughs> just took a dark turn everyone yeah always takes a dark turn with us mate <laughs> Boyd and Martin, the journalists who in the 90s revealed this story, they actually waited until Sperling, the, the model maker, had died before they published the story. He asked them to wait. Right. So obviously with the last conspirator gone, I think that final detail probably will remain a mystery, like the why of, of it all. If, but If I was going to be one of these people that's like hanging on to the idea that the photograph is real, I would be like, right, okay, well, so... They waited until the guy died. Yeah. So, how do we verify that that guy said that 
And even if he did say that, how do we verify that what he's saying is true? What I will say, and I don't actually have this noted down, but I have read about it. There was a mention in quite an obscure publication in the 70s. One of the people involved in this photograph said that it was a hoax, but that was kind of buried. That quote was something that was sort of rediscovered after it was blown apart in the 90s. So there, there is some evidence prior to this. But yeah, you're right. I mean, I think if you really want to cling on, you can always find some little gap that you can get a finger hold on. But I think in all good conscience, it's one that you just have to let go, I think. I'm not letting it go, man. I'm never, never <laughs> letting it go. No, yeah, no, I, 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 totally, I totally get what you're saying. I just, with these things, you realise how difficult it is to actually verify anything really when it comes down to it. Even, even stories that, show that there's a conventional explanation like unless you have written you know yeah. signed testimonies and and like maybe they have that i don't know but yeah but if you turn if you turn that on its head the people who do cling to and there's not many of them actually even the the most ardent nessie hunters the vast majority of them now believe that that is a fake of the people who do cling to it they don't apply the same rigor to the question the other way so when they they see a photo or or a piece of evidence that they do believe is Nessie they don't then start going yeah but this but that you know they don't start niggling and trying to find holes in those theories they gleefully accept them so it's that kind of double standard but the this I mean until 1994 this was considered you know a great piece of evidence and that allowed six decades for the surgeon's photograph to kind of embed itself in the public consciousness for better or worse. I mean, it has remained, perhaps always will remain, the quintessential image of the Loch Ness Monster. I I, I remember that photograph, though, from... Am I getting this wrong, right? It's not in part of the montage of images at the start of The X-Files, is it? No, I don't think it is. So so there's something else. Maybe it's like Unexplained Mysteries or something Yeah, like that. I think there's a lot of programmes. It's just one of these images that's yeah. used all... All over the but place. I remember, I remember something like specifically like the opening to the X Files. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure you're right. I'm sure you're right. It might have been unexplained mysteries shows. or, yeah. or um, strange but true or something like that. Yeah, Wetherill's expedition was one of the kind of first investigations of the Loch Ness monster. Obviously, by the kind of mid 20th century, it become a slightly more enlightened pursuit. Less people going about with. Uh, guns and dynamite, dynamite and yeah <laughs> and, and and hippos foots and whatever else feet foots <laughs> you, you, like, something's going wrong with you tonight man it's, it's just sometimes i have a little blockage in my <laughs> language center or something i don't know people should know that as much as i'm i'm like a professional writer martin's the guy i go to there's actually loads of times martin where i'm working on something whether it's a personal project or something for a client, and I actually think about just sending you a little message <laughs> to ask if something that I've written is correct, and, and I, I'm not lying. I like your super ego. I'm, yeah, I'm not lying at all. I can't remember what it was, but there was something today that I nearly sent you a message about saying, is this grammatically correct? You know, because you do come across things and you're kind of like, your brain gets stuck in a groove. So I'm a pedantic bastard, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, but a lovable one, a lovable one. Lovable pedantic bastard yeah. <laughs> with an inability to speak. Very occasionally. <laughs> so there's been loads of these expeditions and investigations carried out at Loch Ness over like the last nine decades or something. And, you know, these have varied widely in approach and the levels of funding that they've had and the degree of scientific rigour, shall we say. The Loch Ness Phenomena Investigations Bureau, it's a bit of a mouthful, was funded in 1962 by author Constance White and a consortium of broadcasters, politicians and naturalists, including Peter Scott, who was son of the explorer Robert Falcon Scott, and he was also the founder of the Worldwide Fund for Nature, the WWF that stole the WWE's original. Yeah, I remember that. I thought you were going to say David Attenborough was involved. No, no, no. So these guys were focused on like passive surface watches for the most part. They were armed with telephoto lenses. They had volunteers manning viewing stations around the block. They had a fleet of vans with mounted cameras patrolling the area, ready to rush to the location of a reported sighting at you know, a moment's notice. 
the LNPIB, which I'm just going to call the Bureau from now on because that's ridiculous. The Bureau. <laughs> Take it up with the bureau. <laughs> yeah, the sorry to our American listeners for the terrible accent. Sorry. Was there an accent there? There was. It was a terrible, terrible. Oh, it was so bad you didn't even detect it. <laughs> must try harder. <laughs> so these guys, they they actually courted the involvement of serious academics, and they dabbled in a number of approaches. Some of them were quite novel at the time. They used uh, long line trawling in the loch to try and see what they could they could dredge up. They even had their own one-man submarine called the Viperfish, which they sent down to try and get nice. tissue samples. And yeah, Viperfish? The Viperfish. Something else. Yeah, sounds like a spaceship in Elite Dangerous. In fact, I think Viper is a spaceship in Elite Dangerous. Yeah. You know, I'm going to now mention to Callum that you now mentioned Elite Dangerous in one of these podcasts. I'm going to try and mention it in every <laughs> podcast from now on. So it was also the first organization to carry out like a systematic sonar study in search of the monster in collaboration with a guy called Professor D. Gordon Tucker of the University of Birmingham. So they were working with serious academics. They weren't just like a bunch of hippies, you know. In August of 1968, Tucker set up an experimental 50 hertz sonar transducer at a pier near Urquhart Castle. The sensors of this were aimed at the opposite shore and it kind of formed an acoustic net across the breadth of the loch, which should have been capable of detecting any moving object that passed through it. Now, the device actually did resolve a number of interesting contacts during its two weeks of operation, most notably a pair of objects, one of which, Mike, appeared to be 50 metres long. Jesus. And and interestingly, this is roughly where that huge object was seen in the, the Urquhart Castle photograph. And these objects were noted to apparently have been ascending and descending in the water column at speeds of up to seven and a half metres a second. Based on the speed of these contacts, sonar contacts, I guess you'd call them, the team's biologists excluded the possibility that these targets were shoals of small fish, expressing a likelihood that there were rather groups of large objects moving in unison. So not like one single 50 metre long object, but also not a school of tiny fish, like intermediate sized objects moving together in unison. Something de- decently sized. Yeah, something, you know, like on the scale of metres rather than than centimetres. Yeah. Uh, these guys, the Bureau wrapped up in the early 1970s, having captured you know, several interesting images and readings, but ultimately they failed to prove the existence of any kind of unknown creature in the loch. That is probably their most interesting finding and it's pretty ambiguous. But they collaborated with another group and that would probably that would probably be the most startling result actually that they, they got. In 1972, a new Nessie hunter, I guess you'd call him, had arrived on the scene. A guy called Robert H. Rines. Now this guy was an American physicist, lawyer, inventor, he was the founder of uh, an educational non-profit organization called the Academy of Applied Sciences. On June 23rd, Rhines was attending a tea party on the loch with his wife and two friends when the group sighted a dark hump covered with what he called rough mottled skin cutting through the water nearby. Rhines was fascinated. Within weeks, he was back in Scotland and leveraging his industrial and academic connections to turn the latest technology to the Loch Ness mystery. His Academy of Applied Sciences teamed up with the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau in its last year or so of existence. And also with specialists from MIT and the US defense contractor Raytheon to carry out what was at the time a really ambitious combined subsurface sonar and photographic study. Again, they had these acoustic transducers that they lowered into the loch, but this time they also had a specially adapted military gun camera that they suspended in the water at a depth of 14 metres. Now, this arrangement formed what was basically a big underwater camera trap. Any large creature entering the sonar beam, it would fire these lights and and capture an image. At 1.40am on the 8th of August 1972, the Academy sonar unit resolved the signal Seconds later, their 50 watt second strobe lights lit up the darkness underwater and the cameras fired. When those Kodachrome transparencies were developed, Mike, they revealed a pair of images of apparently an object that has become known as the Loch Ness Flipper. I don't know if you know this image, Mike, have you? I remember this 
Yeah, yeah. Was it, is there not two? And mm-hmm. some people have like highlighted some of them where they think there's like a a flipper on one, and then is there not another one where some people say they think it's like a face? Yeah. So the face was a slightly later development. There was two images captured of this apparent flipper-like formation. Very ambiguous, but you know it was very impressive at the time. And they had an updated photographic setup in the summer of 1975. But this time, the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau were k- kaput. They closed at the end of 1972, I think. But several of the, the kind of leading lights, including Sir Peter Scott, continued to work closely with the American team. And once again, the Academy captured a series of remarkable images. Now, one of those images appears to show the elongated neck, head, and upper torso of what you might imagine to be a large animate creature. Now, yeah, this is what I it looks a hell of a lot like a plesiosaur, I'm not going to lie. Densitometer measurements indicated that the, the subject was probably about 7.6 metres from the lens and therefore may have been about 6 metres in length. Then there was another image taken, which I think might be the one you're talking about, that was captured during a sudden unexplained disturbance that caused the camera to swing about on its moorings under the water. Now this image is one called the gargoyle. They called it the gargoyle. Now this object, which was photographed at 11.45am on June the 20th of that year, was claimed to be the very face of the Loch Ness Monster, like a close-up of the face of the Loch Ness Monster. Sir Peter Scott actually produced an artist's impression to go along with the photo, showing like a knobbly, invertebrate-like head with these strange protrusions, maybe snorkels emerging from the from the crown. We'll include all these images in the notes. It's surprising today, though, I think, just how seriously the Academy's findings were taken at the time. These images, although they are, some of them are impressive, they saw publication, first publication was in nothing less than the MIT Technology Review. You know, they didn't really? appear, yeah, wow. they didn't appear in Joey's UFO Digest, you know, it was in a proper... <laughs> <laughs> I've subscribed to that. <laughs> it wasn't an art, like a peer-reviewed article, but it was in a you know very um, prestigious publication by a proper university. And they were also, they were revealed to the press initially at a symposium that was held in the British Houses of Parliament, attended by world-leading biologists from Harvard, from the Smithsonian Institution, from the wow. London Natural History Museum. Around the same time, Rhines and Scott published a letter in Nature. Now, the Nature letter, again, that, that's not a peer-reviewed study, but a letter that they sent in. This is where they proposed the scientific name for the creature. Now, a, a scientific name is required to grant any animal protections under British conservation law. So they wanted to, if Nessie was real, they wanted to protect it as a, you know an endangered species. And the name they suggested was Neceritas rhombopteryx, which roughly translated means the Ness monster with the diamond fins which has got to be the third album of the the metal band that we were talking about last week. (laughs) So the the thing is, right, the mid to late 1970s were probably the golden age of quote-unquote serious study of the Loch Ness Monster. In the wake of all of this, in, in the wake of what appeared to be strong evidence, at the time it must have seemed like the existence of an unknown large animal in the loch was, if not comprehensively proven, coming closer all the time to scientific acceptance. That was the the feel, I think, at the time, that soon it would be something not studied by cryptozoologists and monster hunters, but by zoologists. Yeah. Alas, obviously, as we now know, that was not to be. That final piece of uh, indisputable evidence, the smoking gun, I guess, that seemed virtually within reach in 1975, remained stubbornly elusive. Expeditions and studies of the loch did continue, most notably Operation Deep Scan in the 1980s, but save for a few fleeting, unusual sonar contacts, nothing of substance really materialised from that. By the 1990s, a sense of disillusionment and increased doubt had fallen upon Loch Ness, even upon some of the most ardent supporters of the Loch Monster legend. And the case for Nessie, which had previously looked so promising, began to began to show cracks. 
In 1987, Dick Rayner of Operation Deep Scan detected an object on the loch bed near Temple Pier at the site of the Academy of Applied Sciences 1975 sonar survey. Further investigation revealed a decaying tree stump bearing an uncanny resemblance to the Academy's supposed gargoyle head. That's right, I remember this. It is a dead ringer. Dick Rayner also released the original unedited flipper photographs into the public realm, having originally been provided to him by Robert Rhines prior to their publication. Taking a simple side-by-side comparison of the enhanced and the unenhanced images immediately sets off alarm bells. The published version appears not only to have been computer enhanced for contrast, which they said it had been, but to have been manually retouched to produce a defined outline around the flipper that does not exist in the original shot. The unenhanced version resembles, I mean, nothing in particular, to be quite honest. Maybe a stream of bubbles, or Rayner himself suggested in a 2002 blog post that it was actually the bottom of the loch out of focus with a kind of linear gouge consistent with the base of the camera rig dragging through the silt. In the same post, he notes that the camera in the 1972 setup was not rigidly fixed but hung off a plank of wood in the water and was free to rock and pivot around on its moorings. If you look at the the sequence of stills in the MIT Technology Review article, you can see at some times the boat above illuminated against the skylight and then the next shot, darkness. So obviously the camera's bobbing about all over the place. So it could have been pointing in any direction when it fired. Something could have triggered it and then it could have taken a photograph of the bottom of the loch. So it began to look as if some people at the Academy of Applied Sciences were not taking a very scientific approach to the search after all. And that's not to say there were hoaxers by any means, but I think the act of creatively retouching photographs Who did that, of, though? Did they ever find out who was directly responsible for that? I think the I think the team, I think Robert Rhines and his, his artists and photographers and stuff were basically sitting around going, okay, you know, highlight that by putting in a bit of shading around the outside just to make it pop out. You know, in the way that maybe today we might put like a, a red circle around something, but they did it in, a, I would say almost not, I don't know if you would call it a dishonest way, but in a way that, I think misrepresented what was actually in the photograph. Yeah. Maybe and they again, thought I, they did see it though. It was a kind of pareidolia thing, you know, that they yeah. They, I mean, the, they thought they saw it. If you look at them side by side, you can see what they maybe thought they saw, but you can also see that they have very much just essentially drawn the outline of a flipper, which is has has been what has impressed people for for all these years. I think retouching photographs creatively and also producing these elaborate artworks like the artist's impression of the gargoyle head to make it look more like a monster. It's like they're they're seeking to prove a case rather than sceptically examining the evidence, yeah. you know. I think it's relevant that Robert Rhines, not only was he a believer in a plesiosaur, he was a lawyer. And all lawyers are liars, is that what you're saying? No, no, not necessarily. No, I get you, but I, I get you. Podcast can end there, I get you, I get you. He's <laughs> approaching this the way he would if he was in a courtroom trying to prove his client's case. Yeah, so he's an advocate. Yes, exactly. He's advocating for a certain point of view. So it's not a truly, I don't think it's a truly scientific means of investigation. We're talking about sceptical inquiry. Let's just briefly clarify what we're talking about. You know, the word sceptic gets thrown around a lot by people involved in things like cryptozoology or ufology or other 14 topics. They characterise people who disagree with them as denialist refusing to accept what the believers see as you know obvious truths there's also those on the other extreme who use it you know they're using it as a banner to almost in some cases yeah. ridicule people who entertain unlikely or far-fetched ideas to me scientific skepticism boils down to approaching a question rigorously that's all you know yeah. put aside your own expectations it's your own really biases. about falsifying what what you do you know like you if you say okay here's the hypothesis yeah, the entire approach exactly. should be what would I expect to see if my hypothesis is wrong? How does it stand you up? Know, and, yeah. and that's not what a lot of people do. But then you do have, like you say, you have the flip side. You have people, as much as I, I admire some of the stuff that he's done and I've read some of his stuff and listened to him on a lot of podcasts, but someone like Michael Shermer, for example, that is maybe one of the world's most famous skeptics, mm-hmm. it does get to the point where you can't even have an honest conversation about something because he immediately says this isn't true 
yeah you know like it, it aggressively tries to shut down those that conversation you, you become a debunker you know rather than someone who like you say is being open-minded but critical exactly exactly to me scientific skepticism is a, is about trying to prevent biases from yeah. influencing the outcome of what you you find carl sagan said that Science is a way of sceptically interrogating the universe with a fine understanding of human fallibility. Now, some might say that the leadership of the Academy of Applied Sciences were not overly concerned about their own fallibility when they're drawing outlines of a yeah. flipper on a, on a picture, you know. But then he also sent Jodie Foster into space, so... That's true, <laughs> that's very true. There's an obscure reference for you. I think you're right, you know, I think that plays into... The next thing I was going to talk about, the 80s, the 90s and beyond kind of marked an age where sceptical science and more speculative subjects became more polarised and hardened against each other. You've got sceptical works like Carl Sagan's uh, The Demon Haunted World, James Randi, a lot of James Randi's work. You've got things like uh, Richard Dawkins' uh, Enemies of Reason. These all achieved widespread success. Those of a, a kind of rational bent found themselves better armed than ever against, you know, pseudoscience and that kind of thing, but also in some cases with a, a newfound fervor and dogmatic approach, uh, which is, I think, what you were kind of touching on there, Mike. Yeah, you can go too far either way. Exactly, basically. exactly. And, and for better or worse, the days in which a curator at the Smithsonian would talk about the possible existence of the Loch Ness Monster based on a few sonar contacts, blurry doctored photos and some imaginative artwork. They seem pretty much to be resigned to the history bin. It's funny though, I, I, so I was just going to say, yeah. every now and then, every now and then, something does get published in a journal and it causes an absolute furor mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it challenges people's worldviews and it might not be right, but it has actually been peer-reviewed. Yeah. And every now and then you'll get, like, Nature, for example. The journal Nature has, has published things which do suggest that the that, that some mm -hmm. aspects of the, the, the current view of the world may not be quite right. There are journals that do mm -hmm. publish stuff every now and then, which you really just would not expect. And there's normally a rebuttal. There are little kind of... Um glimmers of that but it's definitely much much less than it was you know in the 60s and 70s yeah yeah absolutely on the other side of that having been abandoned by mainstream science banished to echo chambers on the internet many of the kind of surviving speculatively minded subcultures ended up spinning further and further into pseudoscience and paranoia almost because i think they've been abandoned by science. The voices of people with innocent interests in cryptids or UFOs started getting drowned out by proponents of like conspiracies like the Flat Earth Movement or um, things like climate change denialism, anti-vax, and particularly in the case of cryptozoology, uh, young Earth creationism. It seems quaint to look back on a time when serious scientists and ardent believers would get along with each other and collaborate on a quirky project like a monster hunt, even if they didn't take it that seriously. It's just a cool thing. Yeah. To me, it's almost like a, a cool science outreach. Even if scientists don't believe what they're doing is really going to turn up a monster, it gets people interested. Kids see it and they go, that's cool, they're looking for the Loch Ness Monster, and they look a bit more into it, and they maybe, because they're dealing with real scientists, they learn a little bit of real science from it, even if no one discovers a monster. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think there's something positive in doing that, even if you don't believe in these things. There's something positive in collaborations between science and the kind of the, the more unusual. Absolutely. And I think just my, my last sort of thought on that idea of like opening yourself up to things a little bit while still being critical mm -hmm. is that if you take this super hard line with absolutely everything mm -hmm. and you apply scientific rigor to absolutely everything in a way that avoids any possibility for speculation ever, yeah. then you actually end up stopping the development of new science. Of course, yeah, of course. Because it does take people sometimes to make a speculative leap. It doesn't mean that they throw their hat in and say this is 100% true, but they're, they're willing to follow the thought and say, well, let's yeah. just see where this goes for now. Well, look at uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, for example. This is the guy who... Big Alfred. Yeah, well, he, along with Darwin 
at the same time and separately to Darwin came up with the theory of natural selection. Darwin ended up taking most of the credit in terms of the history books, but Alfred Russell Wallace came up with the idea separately around the same time. They both realised that they had both developed the same theory and they actually presented it together to the scientific establishment. But Alfred Russell Wallace was a guy who was dabbling in stuff like spiritualism and, you know, all these kind of, I don't want to say new agey beliefs because it's, it far predates all that, but he was dabbling in a lot of kind of occult and weird yeah. ideas that were complete scientific nonsense. But part of me thinks, you know, if he hadn't been so open to to new ideas, he would never maybe have stumbled upon the idea that led to him stumbling upon the theory of natural selection because he was open-minded yeah he let in a lot of nonsense but he also hit upon something yeah. you know that was genuinely real and and fascinating that's what the problem when you get the idea of like a reliable witness or a reliable or a reliable theorist yeah is that if for example what we're talking about earlier on if you put tom fullery in the title or something yeah 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 you can just shoot that person's ideas down immediately and actually really you should take every idea on its own merit, because yeah. people are. I mean, people talk about like Isaac Newton, and you know, he was involved, and he had an interest in alchemy and, yeah. and things like that, and had some very very strange ideas. Partly, he was a horrible person as well. But um, you know that people will say like, on one hand, he was a great scientist, but he also sort of looked at all this other stuff. And I, I think there can be a thing where you throw too much at the wall. Yeah. You know, if you throw everything, but but you should look at everything. It's like it's like a scientist is just as, just as likely, in my opinion, to have unfounded ideas as someone who's non-scientific. You know, it's just you should take each idea uh, as its own thing, and we'll probably cut this this rant down anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think as long as you you apply logic and reason to everything i don't think there's any harm in doing a little bit of speculation because even if most of what you come up with is crap can i can i tell you an interesting story this might be we can maybe cut this out if you want to we could maybe even do a podcast but at some point some maybe point. we'll get two podcasts out of this recording session <laughs> yeah no but it was just when we're talking about like my dad was a mental mm-hmm. health officer i think i've maybe told you this story before and i'll just give the, the cliff notes version of this but he used to have to interview people and assess them as to whether they were a danger to themselves yeah. or others and whether they should be detained because of that. Mm-hmm. And he would do that with a psychiatrist. They would both evaluate the person. But I always remember him coming home one day and although he normally didn't talk about his clients all that much, like he, he told me this story about this woman that he'd interviewed and she had given this this story about how the moon was a <laughs> spaceship and there is there is actually yeah, a yeah. conspiracy theory uh, like you know there's hollow earth there's like the hollow moon theory and all that. in fact there's not much a conspiracy theory there were actually some legitimate scientists not involved in the idea of it being a spaceship but the idea of there maybe being a void inside the moon but anyway it's just it was interesting to me that my dad always applied the idea that all these things were mm-hmm. delusions but this woman gave this story and he wondered if she'd read it somewhere because it was so yeah. cohesive and it was about how the the moon was a spaceship, and it, and and all this idea about how there were there were people who lived inside of it, and how they were like controlling us. But there was there was a whole big massive arc. Is to this, this not this the story. David Icke theory? Does David Icke not have the, a theory that the moon is a spaceship and it's actually projecting reality maybe, onto Earth maybe, or something like that? Maybe, and it could, and do you know what it could have been? But I remember. Um, no, it wasn't that. It was more like about like how humanity was enslaved by the people right. who lived there. I think that is like, related like, to the David Icke. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe it is, maybe it is, but it's just I remember my dad saying that. Obviously didn't believe it, but he said she was so convincing at one point during the interview <laughs> that he did actually. Yeah, just <laughs> one moment where the door opened up just enough for me to be kind of like... What if what if this woman's right? It's convincing. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so we can probably yeah. cut that out of the podcast, but I just always thought it was an interesting idea. That I think the you... sign that she's crazy there is not that she believed that, but the fact that she retold the whole thing to a mental health professional. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> that's what marks you as crazy if you think that that's appropriate discussion material for a mental totally. health professional. Sorry, mate. Lock monsters. No, that's okay. Uh, that, that's, that was actually quite an interesting little aside, but... Basically, what it all comes back to is the the debunking of the surgeon's photo was yet another body blow on top of all of this other stuff that came out. And also, 
advances in like high resolution sonar had determined that fluctuations in temperature were actually capable of producing false contacts in older hardware and that cast a whole load of the non-photographic evidence into the question as well. Then in 2003, a team from the British Broadcasting Corporation right. carried out what was at the time, I think it is still today, by far the largest sonar study for a TV program called Searching for the Loch Ness Monster. Now, I actually watched this on TV. I think I, I think I might as well. Is, is the chap with the beard in this? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. But they used multiple boats and they had GPS tracking and they had 600... 600 separate sonar beams and they swept up the lock from end to end from shore to shore and they found nothing so this is the situation in which Loch Ness research finds itself in today it's like the more it's studied the weaker the evidence for a monster seems to become and yet you know many still hold to a belief in a huge unknown creature every year Dozens of people observe and photograph phenomena on Loch Ness and other lochs, of course, which they believe indicates the existence of large serpentine animals living in Scotland's inland waters. Are these all simple misidentifications? That depends on what we're claiming to identify, doesn't it? So what are loch monsters? Just what exactly are we expecting to find? In the next episode of this, I'll be diving a little bit deeper that was an intended pun <laughs> into the identities of some of the suspected culprits more puns more delicious puns <laughs> we'll also be looking at some of the more recent research into the legend while we've got your ear by the way we should probably take this opportunity mike to let the listeners know that Talk Until Dawn is now available i think you did mention this at the start actually it's available on most major podcasting services we're on Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, Deezer, you name it. Uh, if you enjoy these episodes, please do take a yep. moment to subscribe on whatever your preferred service is. It helps us out so much. Uh, and reviews. And uh, review, yes. And review, like, star, heart, whatever else. Reviews, 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 <laughs> reviews. <laughs> you smash that like yeah, button, like subscribe. <laughs> if you're listening to us on the Ghastly Tales YouTube, that was a good segue, just to say that if this series starts to do well, we will probably move it over to a podcast full-time. Uh, we might break it off into its own YouTube channel or something like that. We just don't want to. We don't want to fill up the Ghastly Tales YouTube with just these. You know, we want to keep everything a little bit tidy. If you enjoy these, now's now's a great time to subscribe to the Talking Till Dawn podcast. Absolutely, Mike. I think I see a little band of light on the horizon. Absolutely, the sun's coming up, Martin. It's time to go. The sun is coming up. Guys, thank you so much for listening. We'll be back with another episode real soon. We'll have one more episode on Loch Monsters to do. It probably won't be the next episode. It'll probably be the one after that. Until then, take care of yourselves. See ya. Using, this is good an excuse as any. <laughs>